Welcome and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us today in this Innovative Sustainable Construction Conference where we are going to dig into all the opportunities and challenges that the sector is facing in the green transition. I will tell you more about our speakers and how uh, the conference is going to be developing today. But before, I would like to give the floor to our Director General, Has Wolfgang Busch, for an introductory remark. Please, Hans, you have the floor. Thank you. Dear members, clients and friends of AHKDB Lux, dear participants in today's event, dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, a very warm welcome for all of you from my side on behalf of the Belgian German Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce. It was just two years ago in May 2019, as part of our 125th anniversary celebrations, we held a major, Antwerp in, major event in Antwerp on the topic of the circular economy. I'm sure some of you were there. We would like to follow up on this today with the event Innovative Sustainable Construction. In the meantime, since 2019, quite a lot has happened. Fridays for Future has gained great visibility and awareness, albeit limited in 2020 by the pandemic. The European Commission has declared the Green Deal and recently raised the EU's greenhouse gas reduction target to 55%. President Biden has brought the US back onto the international stage of climate negotiations a couple of weeks ago, putting it back under the umbrella of the Paris Climate Agreement and recently taking the driver's seat for climate protection with a virtual climate conference on Earth Day. And last but not least, the Federal Constitutional Court in Germany declared the week before last that, with a view to the future of the younger generations, climate protection in Germany must also be underpinned by concrete measures for the time after 2035, and a new climate protection law is already on its way to Parliament. So we are on our way today with the, what I think is an exciting topic at the right time. Ladies and gentlemen, why innovative sustainable building? In recent years, we as a Chamber of Commerce have accompanied several events and business trips on the topic of uh, sustainable building. The main focus here was on questions of energy efficient refurbishment of existing buildings, because we all know there's a great potential for savings worldwide, not only in Belgium. Today's event will focus on a different question. How do I have to or can I actually build new buildings in such a way that questions of sustainability CO2 reduction, the use of materials with an ecologically positive balance, etc., are considered from the very beginning. In fact, this already starts with the question of the building materials as such, which are used, as we will hear later. The exchange on innovative and sustainable materials and processes in construction has also the advantage that the best practice examples are exchanged, which hopefully will quickly find imitators, and that across borders. Ladies and gentlemen, as in almost all areas of environmental protection, the following also applies to construction. Individual actors, even individual countries alone, will not be able to achieve much here. Larger concerted actions, a joint departure on a larger scale are therefore needed to be able to set positive accents. I'm therefore grateful that the European Commission and the person of Ms. Lindblom, who works as a senior political officer in the DG environment, will give us an overview of the measures planned at the level of the EU Commission in order to bring the topic forward throughout Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now look forward together to exciting contributions on our topic of today. I now wish us all an inspiring event. Thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. May I now pass on to Ms. Rios, the moderator of our event. Ms. Rios, thank you. The floor is yours. Let's talk, and I'm going to pass straight away to our very interesting speakers. And the first one we're going to have, it's a video presentation from Dr. Josephine Limbun, who is a senior policy officer at the European Commission DG Environment. So hi, I'm here today to talk about Levels, which is a new European framework with core indicators to assess and report on sustainability performance of buildings. So why have we done this? Why Levels? Well, if you look at the full life cycle of a building, if you look from the extraction of materials, the manufacturing of construction products, 
the construction itself and transport, of course, and also the use of buildings, renovation included, and end of life. There is a lot of resources being used for buildings and construction. 50% of all our energy consumption goes to that life cycle of buildings. 50% of our extracted materials goes to buildings as well. 30% or a third goes to the water consumption which is linked to buildings. And 30% of our uh, total generated waste is construction and demolition waste. So there's a lot of resources being used and that gives rise to a lot of environmental impact. We need to use these resources more effectively and uh, we need to consider the full life cycle. So that's what Levels is about. So Levels is a holistic approach where we look to bring buildings into the circular economy. And we want to make life cycle performance understandable to different kinds of stakeholders. This slide shows you the whole life carbon of a building. The whole life carbon consists of the embodied carbon, which is linked to the materials, and the operation carbon, which is linked to the use phase of the building, so heating and cooling, etc. On the x-axis, you see the um, lifetime of the building, and on the y-axis, you see these carbon emissions. What we do today, typically, when we talk about buildings and energy efficiency and so on, we look at the yellow part, the operational carbon. But we believe that we should look at the full life cycle, the whole life carbon. So that's just one example of what Levels does. So what is Levels then actually? It is an EU-wide assessment and reporting framework for sustainability of buildings. It looks at the whole life cycle, as I just said, and it is a robust approach to measure and improve the building performance from design to end of life. Levels consists of a number of core indicators which have been developed and tested together with the building sector in Europe, across the EU. It is an entry-level tool, which is really targeting the mainstream market. You don't have to be a, an expert in life cycle thinking to use levels. On the contrary, we are doing this tool, or we have been doing this tool, because we wanted to bring this kind of concept to those who have not used this kind of thinking before. When we developed levels, we decided to do it for residential and offices and we have covered both new build and renovation. What you can see on the side here is the process that we have gone through to develop levels. We started back in um, 2015, quickly set up a large number of stakeholder groups to help us and support us throughout this process. And then back in 2017, we had a beta version, which was then tested uh, for two years by different kinds of building projects throughout Europe. Based on that uh, response, the feedback that we got, we have now been able to, to finalize the uh, final version of Levels and to publish it last year. And now we are working to develop different kinds of web-based tools to train, uh, practice how to work with it, but also to actually use it on your building project. So here you see Levels. This is what it is. First, to start with looking at the uh, six uh, bright blue macro objectives. These are really the sort of the key points that we want to make. It starts with um, greenhouse gas emissions throughout the full life cycle, where we have a couple of indicators to, to target that. You can see the indicators to the right hand side. Then we also have the material flows, which we want to be circular and resource efficient. And we have some indicators for that as well. Then we have water use. And there we have uh, gone through the different resource uses, but we also have the area of health and comfort. We have uh, resilience to climate change and the cost and the, the value and risk of buildings. In all these areas, or in all these, for all these macro objectives, we have indicators. I want to stress that you can use levels at three different levels. The level one is at the conceptual stage where you use the indicators in a qualitative way. Uh, in uh, level two, you use the same indicators but in a quantitative way. That is at the design and construction stage. And the third level is when you're actually uh, you're done with your building, you check what the actual performance is, and you can also use some of the indicators to monitor the performance uh, afterwards as well. So what are the key benefits of levels that, that we think it has, and what we have also understood from building professionals having used it and having looked at it, I think. It is a common language. That's a really important thing. And it is based on existing industry standards. It tracks performance throughout the full life cycle. 
it can underpin, or not only can, but it will underpin future policies for sure in the, at the EU level, but we also see how it starts to, to attract uh, attention uh, in different member states. Why would they sort of just uh, reinvent the wheel again now that we've spent so much time in developing this? We see how it can help us to future-proof buildings, in particular in relation to, to climate targets. It enhances dialogue, because if you need to think about the full life cycle, you need to have different building professionals communicating with each other, and Level supports you in that. It supports the, the development and skills and understanding of sustainability in your organization. It is, as I said before, for the mainstream market, which is quite new for, uh, for such, a, such a tool. It should be a simple entry point and take the user from one step at a time, going through one level to the next level. And of course, we also have a number of big certification schemes active in Europe, uh, which are now looking to align themselves with some of the main indicators of levels, because they think that is important to, to be aligned. So just saying that whether you are working in, uh, in planning, in design, in uh, finance, execution, or actually in, in policy making and decision making uh, for public authorities, you can really uh, feel confident about levels because we've had all your kinds of different uh, stakeholder groups involved when we developed and tested levels. What about the policy context? Well, you know about the EU Green Deal that was um, uh, adopted by the end of 2019 of the new commission, the existing commission now. They set out their agenda for, for greening Europe. There have been a lot of, of um, communications and other initiatives coming out since then linked to the building sector. I've, I've mentioned a, through a few here, um, the Circular Economy Action Plan, the Renovation Wave and the new European Bauhaus. These are all looking at life cycle thinking and circularity and levels plays an important role there. So uh, as a, a key thing that I want you to remember after, after this um, presentation is that levels indeed brings minimum number of indicators uh, but try to maximize the leverage of uh, sustainability. So what's next for levels? There's well, plenty of things both in relation to policy, to, to research framework of the European Union, um, also in relation to what we're doing now uh, as I mentioned before about developing web-based tools to, to use levels and to practice uh, on regarding these concepts. Just to give you a glimpse of what it can look like in policy, last month uh, the sustainable, sustainable Finance Taxonomy was adopted by the Commission and there if you look at new buildings and new big buildings you will see that we have included a criterion on reporting on whole life carbon and this refers to the levels methodology. That's one example but as you can see there will be many more. I want to thank you for your, uh, for your interest and I encourage you to go to our website and of course also to join our LinkedIn group. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion uh, later about how these uh, setting the standards can actually help businesses to be able to join this wave of, uh, of fighting against climate change and making uh, construction more sustainable. You're seeing now that we are running a poll about the presentation that we just saw, so we encourage you very much to so there we go. Um, the question was, are you aware of the importance of life cycle performance of buildings in relation to reduction of carbon emissions? And you, and as you see, um, most of you were actually aware, but not working yet uh, in this way. And then we have, um, no, the actual importance of it is new to me, uh, 21%. I'm really happy that that 21% joined the, this conference. And yes, I am already including this kind of thinking in my work, 25%, that's absolutely brilliant. Really happy to see that no one was unaware of these, of these, uh, of these aspects. So thank you so much for participating and for being so active. And now I would like to move into the next presentation. For the next presentation, we're going to have Professor Olivier Bassard, who is the CEO of Stiligence and ArcelorMittal Label. So, uh, and he's going to be talking about circular construction. Hello, everyone. Thank you to let me the opportunity today to exchange with you about circular construction. Our world is 
facing a really huge challenge. And when we look at our global CO2 footprint, we realize that the building where we live, the building where we work, the building where we do sports are representing 44% of the global CO2 emission. Today, general opinion is focusing a lot of attention on CO2 emitted by industry, on CO2 emitted by transportation, the trucks, the car you are driving. But we need also, if we want to sustain a way of life, to change drastically the way we build and we follow up the or building infrastructure. We need to define new approach to sustain our way of life by doing buildings which are decreasing the amount of resources we are using to build them. Buildings which are decreasing the impact on the climate and are reducing the effect of the climate change. One way, if, if we think about steel buildings, is to really optimize the design, to really change the approach we have towards the material we use. And today it's entirely feasible to use high string steel to design an erect building. This will have a direct reduction on the amount of material which is used, as you can see on the slide, we can significantly reduce the amount of material which is used when we use higher strength steel. Another way is to put the right material at the right place. So to choose the proper material to do the construction and also to choose the right steel to put at the right place. You see on the graph a comparison for an industrial building. So it's a type of building where the, the structure and, and, and the envelope, I would say, play a, a major role in the environmental cost. So when we use higher strength steel, we can directly see a big reduction in the carbon footprint, but also by choosing the right steel that you will put in the building, it can have a massive effect. Some weeks ago, ArcelorMittal has launched a new decarbonized steel on the market, which is sold under the umbrella brand Xcarb. So it's steels that are on the market that will allow you to drastically reduce the environmental footprint of the building. But that's not enough. We need, of course, to reduce the cost of our building today. But if we want to sustain for the next generation and not put the burden of our action on the new generation, we need to change our business model. We need to move from a linear economy where we produce the material, we erect the building, we use the building, and then we landfill the building. We need to change this paradigm and really entering into the circular economy. There are many ways to enter into circular economy. The first one is to think about the recycling, the recycling of the material. Steel is one of the most recycled material on the planet. Why is it one of the most recycled material? First of all, because steel can be separated really easily from the other materials. Thanks to its magnetic properties, it's really easy to sort out steel. But that's not enough. To sort the waste does not mean recycling the waste. 
So since the 80s, the steel industry has created a value on the market for the scrap. So any piece of steel that you will bring back to the recycling park, your car, the waste of the construction, they have a market value and they become the raw material for the steel industry to produce new steel. So the market is totally organized technically, but also in terms of value chain. Is it enough? No, it's not enough. We need again to go one step further and start to think about our construction material as a material bank. Why do we need to recycle something if we can reuse it? And when we think about steel, it can be done easily. So first step, when you think about your building, you need to think about them in a way that you can easily refurbish building. Today, most of the building that we destroy, we don't destroy them because they have structural issue. We destroy them because it's not economically viable to refurbish them. So when you design your building, you need to design them by decomposing the function. You need to have the structure which is decomposed from the envelope, which is decomposed from the internal partition. Like that, you can easily renovate, you can easily rearrange the internal shape of your building. So here it's an example of a quite massive building which has been rebuilt using the element of the previous one. So it's the Court of Justice of European Commission in, in Luxembourg where Dominique Perrault has reused the structural member to build the new building. So as you see on the, the picture, the, the steel part of the building has been dismantled. The concrete part has unfortunately been crushed. The rebars have been recycled into steel and the aggregates have been landfilled for this project, but it is today possible sometime in, 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 some, uh, in some region to reuse the aggregates. And then the, the steel element have been refurbished and as you can see, the elements have not been reused exactly in the same architecture. They have been adapted and put in shape to fit the new architecture. On the drawings, we see in the middle a connection, which was a connection of the previous building, which is not a connection in the new building. So reuse, it does not mean one-to-one -one architecture. You can also adapt the architecture of the new building with the reused elements. So you see now the, the lobby of the, of the building after reconstruction. It has nothing to deal and it's totally different from the previous building. So to foster this and to, I would say, really use the potential of reuse, we need to think about the prefabrication. So prefabrication allow us to have also less people on the job site. We saw last year, and unfortunately it continues this year, that COVID crisis highlighted a lot of issue for the construction sector. And today it's far less easy to have hundreds of people on a job site. So if we rely on prefabrication of the element, we will have 
far less people that are on the job side and far less people needed to assemble the element. But also what is an advantage of this prefabrication is the faster installation. Of course, buildings are growing faster, but also buildings are demountable. So here is a, a picture of a usual connection made with steel element. It is bolted. It means what has been bolted and assembled can be debolted and disassembled. It means that it really is the potential to reuse the different element into a new building. So if you need to remember something from this discussion is first of all optimize your building. So use advanced material that will allow to decrease the amount of resources we will use. Do and design your building in the most flexible way as possible to make them adaptable, transformable. And finally, try to make design that will allow deconstruction and not demolition of the building. This will help the future generation to reuse the element that you will put today in the building. Thank you for your attention. Now I would like to give the floor to my next speaker today, who is going to be um, Anton Martens, uh, who is a business developer at BC Materials, and he's going to be talking about future building. Hello, everyone. We're very excited to talk to you today about the future of building. Because as we all know, the building sector is a very important sector, creating a lot of jobs and a lot of economic value. But it also has a shadow side, being responsible for a third of air pollution, 30 up to 40% of CO2 emissions and 30% of global waste. And as we all know, all of those inter indicators will have to go down in the future. But part of the solution lies in that waste. Because every day, millions of tons of earth are excavated in Europe. We, with BC Materials, we have the gift to turn that waste into compressed earth box, into building materials. And they're actually very good building materials because they produce 90% less CO2 than fire bricks. They're perfectly circular, zero waste, zero air pollution, and four times better acoustics, as we've proven with this very interesting project in Edegem. It's a bio class where children can learn about nature and environment, and they're actually in a very safe and nice and healthy environment at the same time. This technique of turning raw earth into compressed earth blocks, we actually learned it in Burundi, where we were forced to work with local materials because it was very expensive to import other materials. But we were so glad to learn from the local builders, entrepreneurs and other people to actually work with local materials that are very low carbon, that are very healthy and are nice to work with. And we were so happy when we came back that we really wanted to integrate this into Belgium and to Europe. And that's why we, with BC Architects, integrated already a lot of raw earth in our projects. But we also wanted to nudge the market even more. That's also why we wanted to create a spin-off BC Materials that is transforming excavated earth of Brussels into building materials. Because we see that there is so much potential, so much earth being excavated every year, that we really wanted to push the market to think a bit more about the materials that it has on the spot instead of importing all kinds of materials that are very expensive and that are also a lot of more CO2 intense. In Brussels alone, 2 million tons is excavated every year. In Belgium, it's 37 million tons and in Germany, it's even a lot more. Most of that earth is never used in the construction process. It's usually used to fund roads, to be delved into mines, to be put into uh, mountains. It's a very non-circular, non-efficient uh, way of working. In our process, we can actually dig into what is happening at the construction site by using the yurt that is excavated on the spot or intervening in the transport 
and making a stock at our own production site with the earth that is excavated. And that way we can cut the emissions, the CO2 emissions of the transport and we can produce in a CO2 neutral way, building a stock for all people, all construction companies who are building in Brussels or close by. In that way, you can replace a lot of traditional materials on the market. For a briquette, which can be compared to a brick, 11% for the Brusselaire, a finishing for the walls, up to 3%. And for the castar, who knows what it could be, because the castar can be used for floors, walls, design pieces, furniture, whatever you can imagine. The Brusselaire grey, for example, is a very nice finish of your wall, it can be very modern. You have also the Brusselaire red, which is used in this case in a town hall in Kuckelberg, which has a very nice uh, feeling, a very warm feeling. And you also have this very peculiar project called U Square, where we transformed the old police barracks into class rooms for students and teachers. And we wanted to do something extra in acoustics. So on the ground floor, you first have a classic uh, clay plaster, and then on the top floor, you have a much more rough acoustic plaster mixed with cork and hennep, which are all bio-based uh, materials that can be reused, that can be reintegrated into nature again. And they have an even more better acoustic effect. Clay plasters are actually a fantastic product because they practically have no global warming potential. 70 times less than gypsum plaster, 100 times less than cement plaster. It's a fantastic product and it's proven by the LIM conference who has made a very accurate analysis about all the impacts of the production and application of a construction material actually has. Clay plasters are so great, they actually improve air quality, they improve acoustics, they regulate the humidity and they mitigate the temperature. So in summer you'll feel a bit fresher and in winter you'll feel a bit warmer. It's a fantastic product but it's also stylish. It's not only sustainable but it's also nice and modern to have in your current environment. We think it's really important that those who decide what kind of materials are used in buildings think about the people who will actually live in those buildings, who will work in the building, who will grow up in those buildings. The healthier the products you use, the better for everyone inside the building that it will be in the future. If you look at this Castar grave, for example, it's with a round earth floor, it's 100% circular, CO2 neutral because you don't have to burn anything, and it's complementary with floor heating. Not only helping this generation, but also helping the future generations. The Castar can also be used for very big structural projects, such as the wall, Negenort, which is a watchtower that we built together with other architect group, uh, that can be used as a place to get the perspective on the nature domain. And that was used and built with excavated earth from really close by. But there's also the briquette. And we have to admit, there is a small problem with the briquette. He is too expensive. Our plan is actually to sell to circular champions, people who have committed to buying something that is a bit more expensive because it's an ecologically made product. But we also want to broaden the market and make it even more common by doing bigger projects so we can cut the price and make it possible to sell a lot more people. In a future scenario, we can even imagine that the briquette can be cheaper than a lot of traditional materials. Because as we all know, at some point, CO2 will be taxed heavily, even more heavily than it already is today. Because we want to avoid as much CO2 emissions to not burn the planet. And our material is practically CO2 neutral and it can be used in a very, very, very wide uh, array of applications. And the more that we produce of it, the cheaper it will become in the future. One of those projects that could be used as a real locomotive for reducing the price could be the subway tree in Brussels. Millions of tons of clay is going, are going to be excavated and we could actually build the metro stations with the blocks that can be produced from the clay. It will be an industrial process, cutting at least 50% of the CO2, maybe even more, with, at a very low price and boosting local jobs at the same time, which is something we all want to happen. That's really the essence of the Green Deal, that we can make a circular Europe, a CO2 neutral Europe, by rethinking how we build, by replanning how we build, which kind of materials that we apply, and that there is a lot of assets here in our country, here in our continent, that we just have to reuse and rethink 
and there is already so many techniques and insights that we can apply in the building of today. We were very honored to be selected by the ARD to serve as an example of the Green Deal and our team is super eager to grow and to make uh, sustainable earth materials as a common element in everyday building. We have both a young and experienced team because we are architects, we've already built with our earth, we know what it's like to live in a place like that, we know what it's like to apply it, we know what it's like to sell it, we know what it's like to develop it. We have a lot of talent in our group and we think it's not only important to have an economically profitable model which we can really sustain, but also something that has a real impact on people, in health, in communities, in the lot of what we think is important for future generations. That's why we want to thank you for, having, for taking the time to listen to us and we hope to see you again in the future. For the last speaker, I want to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Cédric Dufresne. Uh, he's a commercial director for Benedux at BASF. And um, please, I'm going to give you the floor. Welcome from my side. Um, I'm actually very happy to talk about sustainability sustainability you can build on with zooming in into a very specific example, an innovation that actually occurred more than 50 years ago, namely Styropor, the BSF foam that has been built from polystyrene. And we are looking now today into how can we make these, let's say, more established products more sustainable and how can we eliminate um, CO2 in the footprint in, in making it in the industrial in, in, in industry like the chemical industry. So the product that I'm going to present today on behalf of the division producing and selling it is a Neopore Biomass Balance. This is the low carbon expandable polystyrene foam that you use in construction applications. Let me see, I can navigate the slide. So, as a recap, why are we talking about CO2 emissions? Well, you all know that we had records over records in emissions. And to give a number, we're talking not about million tons. We're actually talking about global emissions of 37 billion tons in, uh, in 2018. If you look at the last five years, we had the warmest five-year period. So we already see the consequences. So there's um, enough alarming signs to say, well, we have to act, we have to do something, and we have to reduce CO2 emissions in all sectors. And in the end, saving CO2 means, of course, saving us. Well, let's start. Let's start with Neopore, the biomass balance, and let me introduce you this gray material that you have seen now as a background, maybe um, why is it great? Because it has also some graphite, which in, in increases further the insulation power. Let, let me just rewind a second. So I, I want to not focus today on the, the technical capabilities of the Neopore product. They are listed on the left side. It has a lot of um, known um, uh, characteristics like thermal insulation power, Acoustic insulation power is very durable, flexible, versatile, easy to transport, easy to install, and, and also um, it can be recycled. But what is really the novelty here is that we can produce the very same product and save huge amounts of CO2 in the production process, or basically using a different raw material. And that's what I want to um, get across today as a core message. Neopore standard expandable polystyrene for insulation purposes is available in a lower carbon footprint version with reduced greenhouse gas emissions because it's derived from renewable feedstock and by that saving fossil resources. The question you might now ask is how is that possible? And this slide is something I want to guide you a little bit through, so I use my laser pointer here. Now, the first thing is you have to understand the 
production process of making expandable polystyrene. It uses classically fossil feedstock, namely natural gas or naphtha. And within the chemical industry, within the BSF production Verbund, like in um, Ludwigshafen in Germany, for example, or in Antwerp in, in Belgium, we are using a process called the cracker, for instance, or syngas plant, where we then build molecules which are the basis of the product, which is neopore. So if you follow the line of fossil feedstock, we produce the, the classical standard EPS, and we also sell that under this brand. Now, what happens if you would simply switch from fossil-based uh, feedstock to renewable feedstock, namely bio naphtha or biogas? Well, you can theoretically uh, allocate every input amount via a certification allocation methodology to the end product. And that's what we do. So we produce basically the same material. We use certain amounts of renewable feedstock and fully allocate it with a certificate to the product. This is, of course, possible uh, via um, external certification schemes and very well known for the green electricity, for example, where you, of course, cannot uh, count the electrons and, and, and see which are green or which are not green or gray. So this is a very uh, widely used scheme, fully accredited. And the, um, basically, the, the power of this biomass balance approach is that the performance of the materials is absolutely the same. But because we use different feedstock, we can then guarantee lower emissions. And this is what we then commercialize as the low carbon EPS. I hope um, this was understandable. I would like to summarize in benefits and advantages what we're talking about. So again, Neopore is a very well established product. Why would you change? Well, it has already a lot of positive attributes like efficiency in insulation, lifetime durability, it's easy to install, trusted quality, it's very um, resource efficient. And of course, it has a great um, ratio between cost and technical performance. But on top, and that's the novelty, we could establish an innovation regarding sustainability by using different input parameters, having it as a certified um, credit. And what's the CO2 savings in the end that counts? Well, looking only at the raw material, we can save up to 90% of CO2. So really remarkable achievement. I have one last slide because sometimes we talk a lot about numbers, and I will have a lot of numbers on this slide, but I want to make it a bit more practical. So what does it mean, actually? So what could be in the construction sector the, the relevance? And we took um, a single family house of something like 100 square meters with two floors. We as assumed 125 square meter facade to be insulated and we use 20 centimeter of EPS, which results into 25 uh, cubic meter needed. And using a life cycle analysis, an LCA approach, um, we could calculate that you save from the 1200 um, kilogram equivalents, you could save 800 kilograms. So cradle to gate, we talk about 66% CO2 savings, which is, if you look at, the heating um, that you require, well, it's basically three years of heating in a passive house that you save. So quite significant, I would say. Now let me um, close off by, again, thanking you, uh, listening to me, and also the organizers inviting me. I have a couple of further reading links. I uh, will try to manage that via the chat. Happy to answer questions, and I hope to bring have brought over the message. Also, standard products with high performance can have significant less CO2 um, savings by using innovative and novel production methods and certification methods. Thanks a lot.
And now I would like to welcome all of our speakers live joining me uh, to have a conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today and for being part of the conversation. Thank you so much for your very interesting presentations that fed uh, this uh, debate. I'm going to start with the questions that we got from the audience, but I have a lot of more because I'm a journalist and I always have something to ask. So no worries about that. But I very much would like to uh, hear from our participants so please if you have any questions just let us there the first question that i saw was actually for dr limblum i saw this sign for construction is included as criteria in levels is the sign sustainability for recycling also included and this question is coming from peter Branko. so please doctor you have the floor because indeed we have an indicator which is linked to design for for deconstruction which goes through um, how you how you assemble and disassemble materials, for example, which we heard some of the other speakers talking about, uh, what kind of materials you are using in terms of uh, perhaps also um, dimensional standardization so that it is easier to reuse materials afterwards and so on, um, looking at the materials and how they can be reused as opposed to recycled, for example, to improve even further. Um, the uh, the use of the materials. So I think there is there is a lot of it there, um, and it is also so that um, um, if anyone remembers the uh, the the slide that I put up very early on about one hour ago, I guess, uh, which showed the the uh, the whole life carbon performance of a building throughout its full life cycle, we could see that there was a huge peak at the beginning. This is the embodied carbon, which is release then when we are basically when we are, are producing the materials which goes into the building then so i think it is very important and levels recognizes that it is very important to not just design the building for deconstruction later on because that would sort of improve the carbon performance of the building at the end of its life cycle and we don't actually know what's going to happen then uh, today, I mean, we should make everything that we can to make it possible to make something good out of it. But what is very important to, to improve the embodied carbon performance already uh, from the beginning with the building that we're producing today is to use as much as possible, um, you know, the design for, uh, for, for how we can use, how can I say, we should, we should use as much as possible recycled material today because that is what has an impact today and not in 50, 60 years. Um, and we need to use low carbon uh, materials for that, which in many instances is indeed recycled material. Now it might be in certain instances, depending on where we are, etc. but it is actually not the lowest carbon option may not be recycled material. It may be something else, but we need to always take that uh, into account, I would say it might also be that uh, it, it is preferable to source the material locally as opposed to have something recycled from from far away. So you need to see that that balance. But I think that is the that is the sort of the we need to think both both about what are we doing with this building now as opposed to carbon performance and, and what is the potential for the building at the end of its life cycle and the potential of that material. So I, I don't know if that sort of answers the question, but Levels takes all that into account. I hope so. And otherwise, I hope that uh, we we hear from our participants. But I think a whole uh, discussion today, um, it's, it's going around this, this issue of having everything into account when you're designing the, the, the building from the materials that you choose. And here, uh, again, it has to be part of the circular economy that you're trying to apply to this context. So indeed, it's very important to take all of that into consideration. And I, I found that it was fascinating because it's something that happens in any industry, right? It's not only uh, in construction, it's anywhere. Um, I have another question. This one uh, is uh, for uh, Professor Vassar. Uh, what is the biggest challenge to reduce the large role that steel industry plays regarding global to em CO2 emissions? And this is coming from Benjamin Bandam. Yeah, there are many challenges. The, the, the thing is that we need to see what we do with the material because really often people are just looking at the CO2 cost of the material, because it's an easy KPI to, 
to assess. But then we need to see what will be done with this material, how this material will be used, what is the amount you need in the building compared to alternatives. So I, I said by, by Professor Lindlow, the what matter is for me the the carbon footprint of the building. So any material that you will use in the building will add to the total carbon footprint of the of the building itself. Sometimes it's worse to use material with a bit heavier embedded carbon per kilo or per cubic meter, but that are at the end of the day reducing the total carbon footprint of the building. When it when it concerns steel, of course steel is production of steel in a primary way is emitting CO2. That, that's a, a physical a physical thing so when, when, when you need to transform the, the iron ore into, in, into liquid steel, you have carbon emission. But a lot of things are now developing on the market to significantly reduce these carbon emission. So a lot of technologies are now implemented at industrial scale in order to reduce, capture, reuse the carbon which is physically emitted to, to, to do the steel. That's one thing. And for me, the most important part concerns the recycling. So steel is a material which is easy to recycle, that we recycle a lot in in Europe and in, in many parts in many parts of the world. And to when we recover the steel to make new steel, this can be done in a really environmental friendly way. So we don't need any more to, to use the blast furnace. We can simply melt the steel we have to reduce new steel. And this is mainly done with electricity. So if we can source, and that's what we do now in, in most of our mills, we are able to source electricity coming from renewable, renewable production. So solar panels, windmills. So at the end of the day, you, you recover this waste, which is the scrap that you recover from the building industry, from the car industry, from, from the cans, from, from, from anything. You, you, we recover this and we melt it with renewable electricity. So we are barely carbon neutral when we do this. So in the future, th there will be two things, a road that will allow to produce steel, primary steel with really low embedded carbon. And then th the recycling of the steel, which, which allow to, to close the loop and, and to close the cycle. Thank you so much for that indeed. And, and we see all the connections between the different ways in which the materials are produced indeed, and that also adds to the CO2 emission uh, and, and the footprint. So it's important to take that into consideration. I have another question uh, for Dr. Lisbon, um, and I want to do a follow up after this because I want to open a bit more debate. So the question is, will there be a legislation in Europe that aims to use a minimum amount of bio-based materials such as clay, wood uh, in buildings on, at European level? Um, and uh, France recently implemented that 25% of materials for new buildings needed to be bio-based. Um, and this question is coming from Axel de Mac. Not that I'm aware of, anyway. I cannot uh, tell you what's going to happen in the future, but it is not something that I am aware of is cooking. What, what, is, um, what is coming, I think, really, uh, even though we're not quite there yet uh, at the European level, is to follow, follow uh, some of the work that, front, I would say, front-running member states are doing when it comes to look at the whole life carbon uh, of their building projects and, and include that um, that concept in their building regulations. So I, we are working on how to start to, when we talk about decarbonizing our buildings, that it is not only looking at the 
at the use phase of the building, so for heating and cooling, etc. But really looking at the at the full life cycle of the building, and um, so, so looking at the carbon emissions throughout all that. Now, should that would that be done best by including bio based materials or not? There can be many discussions about that, and that might depend on where you are, what are the options, uh, what would the bio-based material be used for otherwise, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'm not an expert in that, um, particularly on bio-based, but um, what I do think is that what we will be doing is see how can we look at the, the full life cycle better and, and, and take that, um, so the whole life carbon, if you wish, um, how to start to include that in different kinds of uh, European policies as well. And we saw, for example, um, a few weeks ago, the Commission uh, adopted uh, what is called the Sustainable Finance Taxonomy. Uh, some of you may have heard about that. So the Sustainable Finance is a, is a big uh, policy initiative from the Commission, which has been running for probably two years now, if I'm not mistaken, and it continues as well. But the first um, part of that taxonomy, which basically presents um, like this, a set of criteria for which different, uh, which you sort of uh, assess different uh, sectors uh, with, and based on how they perform on those criteria, you can uh, you can um, sort of uh, decide if your investment is sustainable or not. Uh, the building sector is part of that taxonomy work. It's one of the sectors which is included. And when it comes to new new large buildings, we have just now included a, a, a criterion for this whole life carbon, right? Um, and actually, the, the methodology that is being referred to is, is the levels one, um, which in turn is based on existing standards, but the level sets out the scope a bit and so on. So there you can see a first... Uh, first way of how we are starting to include this kind of thinking in policy. So it's not setting um, requirements for bio-based materials, but it is setting requirements for, for looking at whole life carbon as such. And I think this we will see this, uh, uh, this going on in different well, our other policy initiatives as well. Thank you for that. Uh, now, the question that I would like to ask is that, um, you know, you've mentioned, uh, you have actually explained levels and how it works and why that in standards in terms of sustainability, we have seen a lot of legislation coming in the pipeline, proposals such as the new Bauhaus. Um, we have a lot of work when it comes to making construction more sustainable and a lot of proposals come in at European level. And I wonder, and this is a question more for uh, the business representatives that we have today, is to what extent you feel that the European Union setting the standards is actually something that helps you to improve your sustainability um, because it, it gives you some guidance on what you need to do. Uh, I think the EU taxonomy is also a very good example of how this can promote promote uh, more sustainable practices. So maybe, uh, um, Mr. De Fresno, you would like to start? Yeah, I would say the, 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 the position of the chemical industry is to um, innovate and provide solutions. And um, so I, we had on, or I had only a couple of minutes to, to really take one example, to make it also very it's simplistic, but we have an array of products we, we, where we use the same approach. And basically, when I also look at the, the question um, bef before that on, on bio-based, it's really about how how this is defined. Uh, in, in my example, I also um, use bio-based feedstock, and that's um, also waste-based. And there's also maybe something I, I should have mentioned stronger. If you look at uh, biogas, it can be produced from, yeah, from, from, from methane, from cows, you know, so from fermentation processes, from all kinds of sources or used cooking oil uh, as, a, as a waste product. So um, I would like to really to, to stimulate that we need to be more open and not to strictly define categories. What is bio-based? Is it only like in the example of the question clay wood, which would again, would need to be assessed in terms of where is it grown? How far does it travel? 
Um, is it against food? You know, the, the complex topics we, we have uh, to, today, yeah, and, and a lot of people remember the, the biodiesel um, industry that was built uh, 20 years ago. And now we are, let's say, at the climax and, and, and revisiting this approach because in, in the end, the greenhouse gas effect is very little, just a few percent. Um, so I would say um, we are very open. We, um, we like to stimulate, we, we talk about designs, we like to collaborate, um, but we are only one part um, the, as a chemical industry. Thank you so much for that. I would like to hear maybe from Mr. Madsons about this. Um, how do you see whether you feel that having European standards, having European legislation push a business to try to be more sustainable, and this is something that helps you in the way that you build your business? Yeah, it's a really important issue because I think the, the Green Deal in general has really put the direction very clearly for a lot of entrepreneurs. But I think at the construction level and also at the level of levels, um, the guidelines are not so clear yet, are not so strict yet. There's not a legal obligation. It's not, it's, uh, it's more like instructions or suggestions. And in that sense, we're very curious to, to what is going to be announced next week. And also the construction product regulation, what is going to happen. I think there is mention of having an, an obligation of an LCA for every building product, an LCA is a life cycle analysis. And I think, like, as Monsieur de Freyne said, it's the most honest way of, of calculating uh, your product and, 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 and what, what are the real impacts. Because the danger is a bit that those who do not innovate and those who stay a bit within their market segment and those who are not really putting their best foot forward to reduce emissions will stay, will, will drag their feet and they will just keep a bit on their market share. And if there's nobody to push them forward, uh, as, as practically only the commission can do, because most building products are, are across, across several markets, not only national markets, then I think it's difficult to really get to the drive that we need to, to, to get to net zero, because net zero is a very big target. Uh, for uh, some products, it's, it's really it's really a huge challenge. Uh, I think maybe some underestimate it even. And so uh, the, the commission has, has to really put, put a lot of transparency and, and, and also really obligations in, into the, 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 the future directives. Can I have a reaction uh, from Dr. Lindlund on, on this? Can we expect the Commission keep them pushing to make sure that this is not just suggestions, but we actually have legislation that is pushing businesses to apply those standards? Uh, yeah, I would, I would love to say yes. Uh, but there are two, um, two important uh, policy initiatives being uh, looked at or being sort of conducted this year from the Commission. There are two revisions, actually. Revisions of the Energy Efficiency Directive and the revision of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Uh, I, I know it's uh, frustrating for, for those who listen to, under, to sort of hear that one part of the Commission says one thing and the other part says something slightly different, but, but just to say that I am working for GG Environment and the um, pen holders for those two revisions, which I think are really key for what we're discussing today, uh, are my colleagues at DG Energy. So uh, we are working very well together on this, and there is a great interest on their side to start to incorporate this kind of thinking as well. But can I just suggest that I think it is very important for those who listen and uh, and feel strongly about this topic to also get in touch with, with other parts, not just me, other parts of the Commission, such as DG Energy, and express uh, the, their, their, their strong views on this, because I think the more people that are really getting engaged, the bigger the chance that we actually get something, that we really take the opportunity now with those revisions to make the, make the most of it in this case. But there is a clear, I must say, there's a clear um, opening uh, in, in this direction. So I think it's, it's well worth pushing from, from, from all sides, let's say. Uh, just to say then that uh, uh, there is, of course, a construction product regulation in the Commission, uh, uh, which other colleagues are looking at, and there is a clear um, 
link between the billing level and the product level, of course. So we, we are all aware of this, whether it's the environment or energy or grow or whatever. And we are looking at very well together and working very well together to, to make sure that the links are there properly. I have a question for all these speakers. Um, is there sufficient collaboration between the different industries involved in the construction sector from material providers to architects um, in the case of BC uh, to make sure that we build a more sustainable, uh, more, we build more sustainably uh, and what have you learned from this process? Also considering as, as uh, Mr. Martin was saying before that the goal of uh, climate neutrality in 2050, it's very, very challenging for the industry as well. Who would like to jump here first? Maybe Olivia? Yeah, so it's clear that we need to have a consultation between between building designers, building owners, and and materials provider, whatever whatever the material. The for me the, the answer is not only on one side. It means of course material producers need to do an effort, whatever the material, whatever the solution, to, to decrease the footprint of the material. But one thing which is really important is the way we use these materials. So at, at the early stage, Professor Dr. Linden said that we need to really focus on, on decreasing today the footprint, the footprint of the building. In a sense, I agree, but I also disagree. Because if this, the use of some material, the, the use of some technologies, will today perhaps drastically decrease the footprint of the building, but the recycling and the waste treatment, that will need to be done within 25 years or 30 years, will be so expensive in CO2, we will just put the claim on our children, that's all. So for me, really something which is really important and it's where the commission is, is, going, is going for, it, it's to realize that the full cycle. We need to take into account at design stage what we will do with the material, with the building, with the, the solution we have used at, at the end of life. And this, whatever the material, I don't preach for, for what, what, to go left, to go right. For me, what is really important is to look the full cycle and to make intelligent solutions. It means to make solutions that will allow to be the best compromise between the cost today and the cost within 20 years. And it would be too easy to believe that being the smallest in carbon today for a building will provide at demolition stage also the best solution. For me, it's a, it's a compromise. It's a compromise between both. And uh, when we we'll go back to, to biosource, so Mr. Mertens showed really well the intelligence of the biosource material. But it's not because it's biosource that it's good. What, what he showed is really good because the material is, is, is biosourced, it's sourced locally, the, the full circle is there. But sometimes biosourced and biosourced insulation are sometimes worse for the environment than other products which are not biosourced. So we need to analyze always the full, the full picture when, when we do something. Sorry, Mr. Dufresne, I interrupted you. No, no, I, I was just uh, yeah. saying this is really a great idea. And I, I really, what, what came into my mind is maybe that's a radical idea that we need an extended uh, producer yeah. responsibility at a time. That we, we, we build a building and then the ownership is, of course, yeah, transferred to the owner, but like many other areas it's already established where waste is actually taken there's a collection system there are responsibilities there are taxes or incentive systems so i could imagine there would be for certain types of 
of buildings, there would be some kind of a responsibility to take it back. And then what we need is full transparency on the materials. And that's that's what we also advocate for. We try to do that in plastics. What What is actually the plastic? Who knows? If I, I take whatever here in a calculator, who, who knows how to best efficiently recycle it because it's not described. And I think it starts with LCA, as Anton said, because there we, we make the full transparency on, on the input parameters, uh, what is the material, and then building something where we say, well, there are several options, end of life. I really like that. Thank you so much for that. And I really enjoyed that uh, you were talking to each other because it's definitely what we want to achieve in this conference, to have an exchange uh, uh, between the industry. I would like to have the reaction from Mr. Martins as well about this question of trying to improve the uh, the collaboration between different stakeholders to achieve a more sustainable construction uh, uh, sector, because I know that that's a lot of what you do. Yes, it's a, I, I want to thank the, the other participants for the exchange here because it, it is a fact that uh, the future of a building will look differently in, in 10, 20 years than it looks right now. And some of the combinations that have to be uh, done with different materials still have to be invented. And in that sense, we, we, we have a long way to go. We also have some traditional techniques that can be innovated and that can be reused and reapplied, which which makes for interesting uh, bed partners, I think. And um, if I may use this moment to also answer one of the questions that is uh, asked in, in the in the chat: To what extent can you use clay bricks to build large building and realize large projects? Um, I totally understand the question because what most people think is that clay bricks are weaker than, than fired bricks, which is a fact, but it doesn't really matter because it matters with which kind of structure that you use to build that kind of thing. And as Olivier has mentioned, if we use uh, strong secondhand steel, we can build as high as we want with clay bricks because the clay bricks will be used as, uh, as inner walls to separate between different apartments or different offices. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it really doesn't matter if you have the right structure or it could also be with sales day whatever at that point is the most locally bio-based with the lowest LCA. If we would import uh, wood from Canada to, to make LC CLT, it will, it will not be a very uh, uh, low carbon solution. If we would use a re recycled uh, steel from, from Ghent, for example, from a steel factory, then it would be a, a, a probably a lower uh, CO2 emission that we would have. So in that sense, Every, every building project will be also a bit of, of a puzzle. Which kind of materials do we use at this kind of site? And that makes the work of the European Commission obviously a lot harder because there will also be a local effect, a local impact, and, and, and that will make it harder. But it's also what, what is intriguing and what intrigues us as designers and as architects that, that uh, it's not because it's uh, hard, that it's, not, uh, that it's not doable, and it's not because it's hard that we shouldn't be doing it. And that's that's really the, the big challenge for the future. Thank you so much for that. We have to close the session already. We're coming to an end. I would like to thank all of the speakers for their contributions.